morning, everybody. This is Grant Kemp with today's disposition series of purchasing with subject to and selling as a fix and flip. I always want to stress to you, I talk about this a lot, that when we're buying with subject to, that's just an acquisition model. You can do anything that you want to do past that point, whether that's renting or fix and flip or, or, or wraps or whatever that is. So uh, I want to keep those options open for you, and that's what the disposition series is all about. So today we're going to talk about fixing and flipping. What might cause you to want to go through and buy a property with subject to and then turn around and fix and flip it? What scenario might there be to mix and match this strategy in a way that a fix and flip makes sense for you? Well, one big thing might be is a short term. You know, sometimes you're going to run into that seller that doesn't want to allow you to hold this subject to property for very long. They really don't like the idea of the fact that their name is going to be on the mortgage for a long term, right? And our job as negotiators is to try and get them past that fear and to let them know that we are there, that we're going to take care of this issue and we're going to do everything that we can and everything that you learn in the negotiation series, you're going to, you're going to employ those, those tactics to try and get this into a long term situation because ultimately that's how you make your most money. But sometimes they're going to be in a situation where they're just unwilling to do that. And that's okay. Our job at that point in time, being good at what we do, is to figure out a solution that meets their needs, right? That still gives us what we want. Well, if they are not okay with a long-term hold on the subject to note, perhaps we can talk about turning around and doing a fix and flip. Saying, look, okay, hey, I'll buy your house. I'll buy it subject to. We're going to do it the way that I've told you this whole time. But instead of me holding it long term for a rental or for a wraparound like we talked about, what I can do is I can just go ahead and fix it up and I'll put it up on the open market. I'm afforded the time that you don't have, right? Maybe they're facing foreclosure or something like that. I'm afforded time that you don't have to where I can wait on the open market. I get discounts with my listing agents. I get discounts with, with you know, title and things like that because the bulk I do. I can afford to put this up as a, as a retail deal and you can't, so I'll go ahead and buy it, I'll put the money into it to fix it, and then put it out on the market and get it for sale. That's one option. Another reason might be equity. What if you've got really high equity in this deal and you just want cash? You know, maybe you're able to take over subject two on it for $88,000, the house is worth 250 and you need 20 grand worth of work in it, right? Let's say that you just get that great contract, subject two. There's nothing wrong with taking it down sub two, selling it out for cash at that point in time. Another option is what if you have low equity and maybe it's just not a good area for owner financing. You'll run into that situation sometimes where you just might not be uh, wanting to move into that neighborhood for owner financing for whatever reason that is. Whatever reason that you might have behind that, this particular area is just not the area you wanna be in, okay? Well, if you're having to buy a house at a little bit higher of a value, maybe you're buying at 82 or 83% or 84 or 85% or whatever that is, well, that's more then I encourage you to buy with cash for a fix and flip. I don't want you to try and do fix and flips unless you're buying at under 75%. But if maybe you're buying at 80% and you're buying it subject to, well, perhaps now when you turn around and you do the retail sale, you know, average Joe is going to walk away with 10% less from their retail sales price as their net, right? Because you've got 6% going to agents, you've got uh, closing costs, you've got the title policy, all that kind of stuff. So typically you can just round that off to about 10% is what they're going to walk away with uh, having to pay in fees. So if you sell it for $100,000, you might be netting 90 from that. Well, if you buy the house at 80, subject to, and let's say hypothetically speaking, you just really didn't have to put any money into it, well, you can make 10 grand on it, right? That's a way to, to sell the sawdust. It's a way to make money off of something that you might have otherwise turned down because you didn't like the neighborhood, you didn't want to drive out there, you didn't like the demographics, you didn't like whatever that was that was going on with it. Uh, rent rates, this ties into why you might want, not want that neighborhood. Because our whole world, as you'll see in the wraparounds videos and as you'll see in their subject to it, our, our whole world is determined by the payments. It's very much like a lease situation in a car. You know, you don't see commercials uh, talking about the price of a car, you see the commercials talking about what they can lease it for. You can lease it for $200 a month, and oh, you know, every, that's what it's dictated off of. Well, our world is the same way. If somebody's willing to pay $1,500 to rent this house, don't you think that they would be willing to pay $1,500 to own this house, right? So rent rates dictate what we're going to be charging. Now, typically, when you back into the deal, and watch the back end of the deal video so you can learn, typically, whenever you back into the deal, what you'll find is that once you use rent rates as your, as your target payment and you back out insurance and taxes and all that kind of stuff, your P&I, your, your interest typically comes to be about nine, nine and a half percent on that. So it plays well together, right? 
but sometimes you'll run into a house. For instance, I've got a house I'm working on right now. I just closed on it last week that I'm doing this. I'm, I, I bought subject to, I'm selling it with owner financing. And this is the reason why is because I bought it. The house is worth like 245. I'm trying to remember what I bought it at. I'm trying to remember. I think I bought it at 170 sub two and it only needs maybe $10,000 worth of work in it. Not very much at all, but the rent rates for it are like 1300 bucks, 1400 bucks. Well, a general kind of rule of thumb, just real easy peasy way to look at things is when you're selling a house with owner financing, typically the payment is about 1% of the sales price with PITI, HOA, all that kind of stuff. So if it sells for 245, I would be expecting a 2000 to $2,500 uh, payment, but the rent rates over there are only 13, $1,400. Well, the payment on the house subject to that I'm buying is $1,400. So it doesn't make sense. I can't put that out owner financed and make the money that I'm looking to make. But what I can do is put the 10 grand into it. I'll have a basis of 180, sell it for 245. Even if I was Joe Schmo and even if I was paying 10% in fees, yeah, it knocks 24,000 bucks off of it. Let's round to 25. I'm netting 220. I'm only in it for 180. That's a $40,000 net profit, right? So it makes sense for me to go retail, even though I'm buying subject to. What if you're cash poor? You may just be in a position where you need cash right now. You just may be in a position where you've got to put some money up to get this deal done, but you can't really afford to have that money staying out on the market. So maybe you are going to put this up on retail to get this thing flipped out. And right now we're in a really hot and heavy market here in Dallas, uh, Fort Worth. We're in a market where houses are selling quickly. You know, houses aren't staying on the market for more than a week or two, typically if they're priced right if your re, uh, rehab was done well, they're moving pretty quick. So this can be somewhat of a short-term solution. If you've got to put $20,000 in to get the deal back, but you would net 50 from doing a retail uh, deal and you can't afford to put that 20 out long-term, maybe that makes sense. You know, whatever that is, maybe it takes no money in the deal, but you just really need some cash right now. It's all about today money and tomorrow money. I talk about this quite often when you've got to really weigh out, what am I making today? What am I going to get with wholesales, with retail sales, that kind of stuff, stuff that's going to make me money right now. But you've got to balance that with tomorrow money, with your rentals, with your wraparounds, that kind of stuff. What about financing? You know, one of the things that I really enjoy talking about is how to use private money on your deals how you can acquire with private money. And you can watch our private money videos to see a little bit more about how this stuff works. And by the way, if you're sitting there and you've got money in a 401k or an IRA or something like that, and you'd like to get that placed, contact me, grant at creativecashflow.com. I mean, I place a lot of people's capital in the market. While you're learning how to do this, you could have your capital be making money for you. And this is one really good way to do it. Well, what if you've got second lien money? And by second lien, if you watch those those private money videos, you'll, you'll learn how I use second lien money on subject to properties. But essentially what it is, is you've got to catch a house up for $7,000. You got to put $8,000 into it for rehab. So you need $15,000. Well, there are plenty of people out there with 10, 15, $20,000 sitting in their bank account or sitting in their IRA that would be willing to lend that. So you talk to them about that. They might lend you that money. Now they're technically in second lien position, but if you're the kind of guy that you should be or the kind of girl that you should be, you should be honorable about this. We understand that your private money investor might be in second lien position. And yes, if the sub two loan forecloses, technically their loan is wiped out, but don't leave them high and dry. If, if their loan gets wiped out, take care of them anyway. It's really important. You can't let your name spread as somebody who's not gonna repay their debt. So even though your lender is in second lien position, it's very important that even if that goes insolvent for whatever reason, you take care of your private money. You take care of the people that are, that are taking care of you. Well, if you've got a second lien on this deal and that money is a short payoff and it wouldn't be covered by the down payment from a sale. So in other words, you take the $15,000 loan for, uh, for, for doing the rehab. Let's say it's a $100,000 house and you need 15 grand to get it going. And they are gonna give you a six month term. As you know, you're new, you can't necessarily get a good term on it. You get six months with this deal. Well, you've got to pay them back 15 grand in six months and you're only going to get a $10,000 down payment. And of that, you got to spend three on your buyer's agent for bringing your buyer in. So you're only netting seven. So you would need to have an extra $8,000 of income in this next six months to get your buyer pay. Um, I'm sorry, to get your lender paid off. And that's not realistic. Well, perhaps maybe it's time to start uh, considering a retail sale so that you can put this up on the retail market, get cash out, get your lender paid off, get your money back that you're looking for. One of the really important things to do whenever you've got this is you've got to look at the whole deal. 
You've got to really look at the whole deal. You've got to really consider what you're doing. So yes, going retail is okay, but you need to evaluate the whole deal. This is this is where the uh, whetstone comes in, the creativecashflow.com whetstone. If you don't already have that downloaded, please download it. I talk about it all the time, but it's because it's so useful. You've got to look at the deal as a whole and see, look, you might from a retail sale, this happens quite often, you might from a retail sale make 10 grand cash. But you're done. That's all the money you make on that deal. But if you were to, to do a owner finance deal, you might make six or seven up front and then make $200, $300 a month for the next 30 years. Well, okay, of course, you're not making as much cash up front as you are if you had gone subject to, or I'm sorry, if you had gone with a uh, retail option. But you might net three or $4,000 less. You're going to make that money back in the next couple of years through cash flow, and then you've got cash flow set up for you going forward from that. And guys, it's all about cash flow. That's why I've named the company creativecashflow.com. Creative cash flow. Cash flow is what we live off of. Cash flow dictates everything. Cash flow is what allows you to go on vacation and still get paid. So evaluate the whole thing. Make sure that you know what you're missing. Consider the entire deal. So who's your crew? This is gonna be really important for you. For those of you who are members of my creativecashflow.com page, you will get access to my referrals, uh, the people that I'm listing here. I'll give you suggestions of who I think do a good job at this kind of stuff, but who's your crew? You're gonna need a closing attorney for your acquisition. You're gonna need to know how to get your subject two side done the right way. You're going to need, you're gonna need a title company for the sale. Get your title company uh, lined up because when you sell retail, uh, that is going to use a title policy. Watch my title policy and subject to video so that you understand why I'm only using a title policy on the sales side and on the acquisition side. So go out and watch that. Uh, you need insurance for your buying and hold. You know, while you're holding it, while you're rehabbing it, you've got to have insurance in place. You're going to need your rehab, rehab crew. Do you have a, a GC, a general contractor that you're working with? Do you just have a crew that you like using? Anything like that. Who's your listing agent? You've got to think about this. How are you going to put that property up on the MLS? There's a lot of flat fee agents. There's a lot of full service agents. There's some that are flat fee, full service agents. You've got to really have that kind of lined up. Uh, look for referrals from your local real estate investment clubs. This is one of the best ways that you can get things. And again, if you're one of my students, then you've got, go to your resources page and you're going to have all of these resources kind of lined out for you. So try not to put a timeline. This is one of the big things too. Try not to put a timeline in your contract. Conversationally, as you're talking to your seller, of course, let them know, okay, hey, I understand the situation, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fix this up, I'm gonna put it up on the retail market, I'm gonna list it, I'm gonna try and find a regular buyer, and then they will buy it from me. When that person buys it from me, that's when your loan gets paid off, right? You let them know what you're trying to do. But try to avoid actually contractually saying, within this next six months, I'm gonna have this sold. Within this next year, I'm gonna have this sold. What you want is you wanna have a more long-term solution lined up for yourself. Most importantly, and I'm going to harp on this all through the series, so forgive me, but most importantly, do what you say you're going to do and only say you're going to do something that you can do. Never promise anything outside of your means. It's all about proper expectations and it's all about running your company ethically, doing the right thing. If you say you're going to put it up on retail, put it up on retail. Don't say this to get them to sign on the contract and then go out there and hold it long term and say, sorry, it wasn't in the contract. Do what you say you're going to do, okay? Um, they've got to understand in this type of situation that when you're doing this, realistically, something could happen. The market could just fall out and, and, and just disappear and it's just not saleable anymore. That's possible. We've seen that happen, right? With our, with our great recession and the crash that we saw. We saw properties lose value just like that. So this is the reason why I don't like putting a timeline and a time frame in our contracts is because I don't know what's gonna happen in the future. I don't have a crystal ball that can say this is definitely going to work. And so I always, anytime I'm gonna be doing something like this, I let them know, this is my plan, this is what I'm going to do, I'm gonna put it up for retail, but if something terrible happens and values drop and everything is going bad, I might have to turn around and rent this, I might have to turn around and do a, a mortgage wrap on that, right? And explaining that to them again, proper expectations up front so that they understand what's happening. Give yourself that time. If you do have to uh, put a time frame in here, shoot for a minimum of one year. Just trust me, just shoot for a minimum of one year. If you're going to put something in the contract that says it's gonna be done in a certain amount of time, don't try to do anything less than one year because stuff happens. Is it worth giving them cash for more time? Is it possible that they're not gonna let you just take over subject two and hold for two years, but what if you gave them you know, $2,000 or $3,000? Is it worth it? 
is it worth it to you? Do you think that you can get this rehab done in time? What are the days on market in your area what, that, that you're working in, right? Do you, do you really genuinely feel like you can get this time done in time or not? And if not, is it worth giving them cash on it? Uh, if that cash, I'm sorry, if that cutoff is in a, in, a, in, in a contract initially, what you've set up is called a balloon. And so watch the balloon video so that you understand what a balloon is. That's something you can do on the commercial side, on your acquisition side, like I explained that in our subject two uh, video. And in the wrap video, you've got commercial and, and, and consumer transactions. Your acquisition is commercial. It's a business transaction. So you don't fall under a lot of the, the consumer business laws, the protection laws like Dodd-Frank and that kind of stuff. You can do a balloon on your acquisition side. Technically, you can do a balloon on your sales side with a, if you were going to put an owner finance buyer in there, which is now a consumer loan, but you wouldn't get any of the court protections. So if you watch our Dodd-Frank series and watch the wraparound video, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But balloons you want to stay away from on your sales side. But what you've set up here, if you're telling them I'm going to get this done in a year, is you've set up a balloon. So your contracts have to uh, adhere to that accordingly. Talk to your attorney about that to make sure that everything is being done the right way. So guys, this is one of the things that I really like. I like taking down property subject to, I like selling them retail. Again, I always say it's about having a bat belt of tools. You gotta be able to pull out a different tool for every situation. I wouldn't have been able to close this deal that I closed on last week where I'm doing the fix and flip and going retail if I didn't know how to do this because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. I can't rent it, I can't, uh, I can't sell it with owner financing because the rent rates are what, what determine my payment, but I can sell it for retail and now I'm gonna walk away with 40 grand. And by the way, this was a deal that was handed to me by a wholesaler because they couldn't close the deal because of how everything was working out. Their values just weren't lining up uh, on what was going on there either. So again, just, just keep in mind, you've got options and use those options. And everything that I'm training you and everything that you're learning through this video series can be mix and matched. And that's the fun part. That's the creative of the creative cash flow. So don't forget to like our pages, uh, Facebook, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. Follow us. If you're, if you're liking what you're seeing, uh, you know, as a creativecashflow.com student, if you're one of my basics members, you do get a discount if you want to upgrade to go to the more advanced videos. And then always, if you need that handholding, if you want somebody to help you that's been there, done that, I do the personal mentoring as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to me on that grant at creativecashflow.com. But until next time, keep on watching these videos and I'll catch up with you then.